Happy Friday everyone, hope you're all having a great day. If not, it's about to get better because here is your next psychology lesson, which is improving the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, the cognitive interview. And this is the AO1, so all that we've got left to do is the AO3 and we'll be doing that next Tuesday and then we'll be done with memory. And we'll be moving on to a little research project, which I'll tell you more about next week. Before I begin, I just want to say a massive well done to everyone who's been trying really hard. I know this isn't an easy situation to be in at all, but you're all doing really well and you should be really proud of you, proud to be proud of yourselves. Um, I've been doing my stars of the week and I just want to give a public shout out. So last week, my stars of the week were Sammy, Natalie, Tom and Phoebe. And this week, my stars of the week are Millie, Lily and Mason. So very well done. I do get limited to two stars of the week a week um so obviously i've been going over but i i just think there's too many of you that are working really hard to only have two um so massive well done and i've already got in mind my stars of the week for next week so let's get on with the lesson i have provided a word document on shimmer homework that you'll need for this lesson if you want to do all your notes on that Word document and then send that over as proof of your notes, that's absolutely fine. Or if you prefer to still do it handwritten and just send me a picture of your notes, just keep doing that, that's absolutely fine. But you will need to pause this video at some point and download that Word document because you'll need um, the information that's on there. Learning aims for today are to recap some of what we have learned about memory so far. So because we're nearly done with memory, we need to go over the things that we did weeks ago. We're going to be able to compare the differences between a standard interview and a cognitive interview. And then we'll be able to describe the four stages of this cognitive interview process. And finally, we're going to be able to explain how the cognitive interview improves the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. And that little giraffe is not relevant at all, but there you go. We've spoken before about how encoding information in different formats really helps with later recall. So with that in mind, I want you to look at these images and try and think about everything that we've studied in memory so far. Which part of memory do you think these images represent? And just pause this video and make one bullet point about each of the six pictures. The first picture was the scuba diver. And the topic of memory that we learned about this study in was forgetting retrieval failure. And there were three explanations of retrieval failure and this study explained or was evidence of something called context dependent forgetting. So massive well done if you wrote that down. And the study was Godden and Badley. And they had divers learning material either on dry land or underwater. And they found that the recall was best when they record the information where they had learnt it. So just pause me for a second and try and think of the other two explanations of retrieval failure. They were of course encoding specificity principle done by Tulving and Pearlston and they said that the more cues a person is exposed to, whether they are environmental or mental, the more likely they are to remember something. And they found this by giving the participants a category and a word. So for example, fruit and apple. And it was an independent measures design. And those that were given the category name recalled the, the words much better than those that weren't given the category name because they had explicitly or implicitly encoding, encoded sorry, a meaningful link with the learning material. And the other explanation of retrieval failure is state dependent forgetting. So our emotional state can also affect whether we remember something. Um, Goodwin et al found that people who had learned the material when drunk could recall things better when they were drunk. Miles and Hardman did the same thing, but with exercise. And then Dali et al found the same thing, but with drug use. So this one might be a little bit more cryptic, but the answer I was looking for is the topic of types of long-term memory. And this type of long-term memory is procedural. So our procedural memories 
are our memories for performed tasks or skills like riding a bike, driving a car, cooking. And all of these memories are implicit, they're non-declarative, which basically means that they're very hard to be able to describe. It's not about knowing something, it's about knowing how to do something. And the brain areas associated with this are the cerebellum and the motor cortex. So quickly, can you think of the other two types of long-term memory that were proposed by Torvink? Pause me if you need to, have a little think. So they were episodic, which is our memories for personal experiences. They're usually tied to a lot of emotion. They're very context specific and they are explicit, which means they are declarative. And the brain areas associated with these memories are the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. And then the other type of long-term memory is semantic. So it's our knowledge for facts. And these aren't linked to any context. So we know that the capital of France is Paris, but we couldn't really recall where we learned that information. But this is also explicit. It's knowing that rather than knowing how. And the brain area associated with semantic memories is our temporal lobe. What about this one? This was a study that we looked at for a evaluation and it was the topic of accuracy of eyewitness testimony, misleading information. In the AO1 for this bit, we looked at Gabbert's and we looked at Loftus and Palmer. But for the evaluation, this is a really nice uh, piece of research support done by Braun et al. And the study if we remember, was the college students were asked to evaluate advertising material about Disneyland containing misleading information about Bugs Bunny, he's not a Disney character, or Ariel, who wasn't introduced at the time of their childhood, so she wasn't around yet. And those who were in the Bugs Bunny or the Ariel groups were more likely to report having shaken hands with these groups, with these characters, sorry, than the control group. So even though Obviously, when they visited Disneyland, Bugs Bunny wasn't there, or Ariel. They, because of this misleading information, there was inaccuracy in their memories. Who remembers who this guy was? We studied about him in the second topic that we ever did on memory, the multi-store memory model. And, of course, this guy is called Clive Waring. And Clive Waring suffered brain damage and it resulted in very severe amnesia. He was unable to transfer information from short-term to long-term memory and this is support for the multi-store memory model. It demonstrates the linear nature of the model, so going from sensory memory to short-term memory to long-term memory, each of these processes are crucial, otherwise we do experience some form of memory loss. This one we studied quite recently and it was the accuracy of eyewitness testimony anxiety and specifically it was about the weapon focus effect and this was studied by Johnson and Scott and they found evidence of this effect because they found that participants in the pen condition identified the man correctly 49% of the time compared to the participants in the knife condition who only identified the man correctly 33% of the time and who remembers the research which suggested that anxiety has a positive effect. Just pause me for a second and try and think about that. It was Christiansen and Hubinet, and this was the robberies in Sweden research. And they had the two groups, so the victims, the high anxiety or the bystanders. And it this basically showed that those who were the most anxious those who were the, in the high anxiety group, who were the victims of the robberies, had the best recall. So they found the opposite of Johnson and Scott. They found that anxiety doesn't reduce recall. And then the last image is the ear. And this refers to the working memory model by Badley and Hitch. And if you didn't get this, try and think now, which part do you think the ear could refer to? And your options are the central executive, which is the boss, and they direct the information to the two slave systems, and the two slave systems are the phonological loop, 
made up of the articulatory control system and the phonological store, and the visual spatial sketch pad, which is made up of the inner scribe, which deals with spatial information, and the visual cache, which deals with colour and shape. And then we have the episodic buffer, which brings everything together and transfers it into long-term memory. So the ear is referring to the phonological loop because it encodes acoustically. Moving on to today's lesson. We've already discussed the fact that eyewitness testimony is often inaccurate. So some psychologists have worked with the police and they've tried to develop methods to improve the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Fisher looked at real police men and women and how they interviewed their witnesses. And he was shocked at what he saw. Your task now is to read the first paragraph in your handout. And I want you to identify three mistakes that police officers were making and explain why each one is a mistake. So either on your Word document or in your handwritten notes, draw a little table like this. Pause this video now and then we'll go through the answers. Mistake number one that the police made was that they bombarded witnesses with close-ended questions. The reason why this was wrong is because close-ended questions provided only short answers and they do not allow the witness to explain, justify everything that they, they saw. Number two, questions were out of sync. Asking questions that are out of sync and not in the same order may be confusing for the witnesses and make their memory less coherent. Number three, witnesses were not allowed to talk freely. So this is similar to mistake number one. The witnesses are unable to justify or explain what they saw, which might make them hesitant to answer correctly. So on the basis of what Fisher witnessed, he developed a new interview method with his colleague Geiselman called the cognitive interview. Your task now is to read the newspaper article on your handout titled Interview Style Helps Child, Child Witnesses and I want you to highlight the four factors which help children to produce an accurate eyewitness account. Okay, so what were the four factors that help children produce more accurate eyewitness accounts? The researchers got more detailed and accurate answers from those who, number one, provided other details such as their surroundings and their thoughts and feelings at the time. Number two, were encouraged to talk about everything they remembered. Number four, those who recalled events in a different sequence rather than chronological. And number four, recalled from the point of view of someone else. And those four things are the four stages of the cognitive interview. So number one ref is referring to mental reinstatement of original context. Number two is referring to report everything. Number three is changing the order and number four is changing the perspective. Your next task is in the space provided on your handout or in your notes, write the name of each of the component of the cognitive interview and a short definition. So this is the table that you should see on your handout. If not, just copy that up into your handwritten notes. Just a quick one though, you cannot use the name of the component in the description. So you can't, for report everything, you can't just say a witness is asked to report everything. Think of a way as well to remember the four steps of the cognitive interview that works for you. So for example, MRCC, you might remember it by My Rabbit Cuddles Carrots. Or you might think of a better way to remember it. Great, so in your left column, you should have the four techniques. So mental reinstatement of original context. And this refers to the interviewer encouraging the witness to mentally recreate an image of the situation, including details of the environment, such as the weather, time, etc. And this is linked to the encoding specificity principle which says that the more cues that a person have, has, the more likely they are to remember something. So just the simple fact of remembering how they felt, what the weather was like, maybe what they were wearing, who they were with, 
those may act as cues to be able to retrieve information. Number two is recalling everything. The interview encourages the witness to report all the details of the event, even the details which may seem unimportant. So sometimes witnesses don't say everything because they believe that the police already knows this. So the cognitive interview encourages witnesses to say absolutely everything, even if it seems really, really insignificant or small. Number three is to change the order. So the witnesses are asked to recall the event in a different chronological order. So, for example, from the end to the beginning. And the rationale behind this is to stop schemas affecting what they recall. So an example of this is something might have happened in a restaurant and in a restaurant you expect certain things to happen. So you expect a waitress or a waiter to come and take your order. So by telling the event in a non-chronological order, it removes those schemas. So it, it removes those things that we're expecting to happen by telling them from end to the beginning. And then number four is changing the perspective and this is where the witness is asked to mentally recreate the situation from different points of views. And again, this is to stop schemas affecting the accuracy of the eyewitness testimony. Because changing the perspective of it, we can see it from someone else's point of view without our pre-existing schemas of events. So that's it for today's lesson. Hopefully you have met all the learning aims. We have recapped what we have learned so far about memory. We did compare the differences between standard interview and cognitive interview. And we looked at the rationale behind why Fisher and Geiselman created the cognitive interview in the first place. We are now able to describe the four stages, hopefully, my rabbits, cuddles, carrots. And we are able to explain how the cognitive interview improves the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. And we're going to be looking a little bit more about that next lesson when we evaluate this. So I hope you enjoyed it. Don't remember, don't, don't remember, don't forget to send over your notes. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or comment on show my homework. Have a lovely weekend. Bye.